I spent an entire year studying for the LSAT and at least half of it was a complete waste of time. If I knew then what I know now, I could have done it easily in less than half the time. I started off in the low 150s and I stayed there for a long time doing LSAT prep textbooks that were really, really boring. And even worse, a lot of them didn't even use real LSAT questions. So one of the biggest lessons I would give to my younger self would be, don't just take a hand-me-down book from a friend, especially if it contains fake LSAT questions, because although I was saving, what, maybe 10, 15 bucks on an LSAT prep book, I was wasting hours and hours and hours of my time doing material that wasn't even helpful that contained flawed LSAT questions. So there's nothing worse than wasting your time on a question where it turns out the mistake is not with you, the mistake is with the question. I would have done my research, I would have trusted reviews online, I would have been willing to spend the 20 bucks or whatever to get a much better LSAT prep book that would have actually boosted my score in a lot less time. Eventually, of course, I learned my lesson and I started focusing on real LSAT prep tests. The benefit there, of course, that the questions were not flawed. They were re realistic indications of what the LSAT actually looks like. And it wasn't nearly as boring for me to do these prep test questions because at least I could measure myself much more quickly. The problem is that measuring yourself isn't necessarily what leads to the benefit or the boost in your score, right? Because you measure your results, you're happy, you're sad about those results, then you move on to the next prep test. But if you're not actually extracting a key insight about what you're getting wrong and why, of course, you are likely to keep making the same mistakes again. And of course, I was trying to use explanations, but to be honest, they weren't really helping that much. If I was looking at explanations from multiple sources, a lot of them would conflict with each other, and they weren't always thoroughly explaining each of the wrong answer choices. They would say things like, this is wrong because it's out of scope. Well, what does out of scope really mean? I mean, any wrong answer is out of scope for some reason, right? So they were of limited usefulness. And I later learned that a lot of the explanations were based on flawed premises. So for example, the Kaplan explanations would lump together necessary assumption and sufficient assumption questions under the catch-all category of assumption, when in reality, those are two very different question types. I learned a lot more when I started writing out my own thought process and writing out my own explanations for the questions I was getting wrong. And eventually, I ended up doing every single LSAT prep test ever released. I got obsessed. I went from being the guy who wouldn't shell out 20 bucks for a better LSAT prep book to being the guy who was hunting down the used copies of even the out of print LSAT prep tests. And you could still get those out of print ones, by the way, on Amazon from third party sellers for typically less than 10 bucks. And you just got to pay maybe four bucks for shipping or something, but it is well worth it. If an extra prep test gets you even a single point more on the LSAT, that could lead to thousands of dollars in scholarship money, maybe getting into a better law school or both. So I learned it would be well worth the investment to shell out 10, 20 bucks for an additional LSAT prep resource if I thought it could help me. And eventually, due to the pain of my score not improving, I became increasingly willing to shell out the 10, 15, 20 bucks if I thought it could help me even just a little bit. And ultimately, I did every single prep test ever released. There were roughly 40 something at the time. Now there's nearly a hundred. And doing those 40 something was actually enough for me to bring my score from the low 150s to the high 170s. I ended up scoring a 175 on LSAT test day, but it could have gone a lot worse. In fact, I nearly bombed the LSAT because although I had focused a lot on studying the material, I hadn't focused nearly as much on what LSAT test day itself would look like. I hadn't properly simulated LSAT test day conditions. The morning of the test, I woke up at 6 a.m. because back then it was only offered at 9 a.m. in person. You couldn't do it online back then. You had to go to a test center, like a law school or a high school. And so I woke up at 6 a.m. and I thought to myself, protein is brain power, it's brain food. So I ate an entire can of tuna fish on a bagel, assaulted my stomach with that first thing in the morning. I had never done that before. And needless to say, it did not go well. Within five, 10 minutes, I felt queasy. I threw the whole thing up, left my apartment, grabbed a banana from a fruit stand on the way to the subway, and took my LSAT on a nearly empty stomach, having vomited just a couple hours prior. But for some reason, whatever reason, I don't really know why, but it all still came together, and I ended up performing great, getting my 175. And so that's where I'm here with you today to say, you know what, maybe simulate test day conditions the morning of. Don't focus so much on the material that you neglect the schedule or routine of what test day itself 
is going to look like. Now, if you'd like my support in helping guide you through your LSAT journey, sharing with you other lessons I've learned along the way since then, helping thousands of students through that LSAT prep process, guiding them to those significant score increases, you can check out the links below the video to find out more and to book a totally free call with me and my team. We'd be glad to help you out. And in the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.